a lot of the information I'm going to share with you came from, um, was produced by a lot of individuals in the Sustainable Cropping Systems Lab. Um, there's some past postdocs on the right. I, you'll see a few papers with their names behind or in front of them. Um, they're all moved on by now. Um, but then the technicians are in the center who have been essential to all of these experiments. Uh, and then current graduates are listed here and some of them um, contributed to these projects, even though you know, there's always a leg. So you'll see re results from their research probably in a couple of years. Uh, here are some of the broad topics we're gonna cover today. Um, we're gonna go in order from establishment to kind of, I guess, harvest, post-harvest management. Um, but actually, we're only gonna be able to cover four of these topics today. So we'll start with the establishment, talk about fertility, a little bit on weed management, and then harvest challenges. There are a couple of great papers out on managing stands for yield longevity um, from the Cornell group and um, from Valentin's group. Uh, we also have some data that hasn't been published yet, but the, we won't have time to cover that today. Then there's also a big topic is dual use, how to manage Kearns as a dual use cropping system. That's um, what we presented on last year. And I won't cover that today either. So this is what we'll hit. We'll kick things off with establishment. Um, we have, uh, we did a small seeding depth study. This is a greenhouse study. How deep do you sow your kerns of seeds? That's the fundamental question. Um, an undergraduate student at the, in the lab conducted this study and Thomas Donnellan, he's now a grad student at Iowa State. Uh, greenhouse study, three different soil types, clay loam, silt loam, and sand. We used two populations, seed from Minnesota, the Clearwater and TLI C4. Uh, pretty straightforward, planted seeds. Um, it, well, it sounds straightforward, but it's actually really hard to achieve uh, to get these seeds at a very precise depth, um, the same bulk density and the same amount of water and all of that sort of stuff. But um, we had seeding depths of a quarter inch to an inch and a quarter and quarter inch increments. Um, pretty straightforward results too. We saw a nice pattern. Uh, the first figure we're looking at here is the percent emergence of the seeds sown, uh, what percentage germinated and, and came up, emerged at these different depths. And we identified an optimal depth, um, which is the half inch, now I have it in metric, but uh, three quarters of an inch deep is, is the optimum depth or 19 millimeters. Um, there's a little bit of wiggle room there, so you can be comfortable going a quarter inch their end a little bit deeper, a little bit shallower, and there's no significant difference there. We also looked at the amount of biomass produced per seedling um, that emerged from those different depths. No difference for Minnesota Clearwater. Uh, all of the seedlings that did emerge from the various depths had the same amount of biomass, but we did see a little bit of a trend with um, the Minnesota or the IC4 population. I'm not quite sure why, but. Um, followed kind of the same as percent emergence. So a little bit larger seedlings that were at that optimum depth, three quarters of an inch. Um, there were no interactions with soil type there. So that those trends held over different soil types. We did see that um, looking at, there were main effects of soil types on both emergence and the amount of biomass. Um, I won't go through these. Some of them are difficult to explain the results, but there were some differences. Uh, if you got any questions, we can talk about that after. So that's how deep, but how about when to seed? Seeding date trial. Um, we planted intermediate wheatgrass seeds at various dates starting in mid-August. Can you see my cursor? No, that's okay. In mid-August um, and sowed seeds at different dates up through December and then started again in the spring. And then we measured grain yield um, that subsequent year. And we conducted this study. We started this study with, what is this? Six different locations in the US. Uh, the two southernmost locations in Arkansas and Texas uh, didn't work out. Um, it was an unfunded study. It was difficult conditions at these two sites in these specific years for different reasons, but we only really have data from Kansas, Montana, and the two sites in Minnesota. 
very different sites, Roseau, Minnesota, far northern location, and then Rosemount. Um, so we built our analysis off of a bunch of work done by Olivier, who's here, um, and his team. And this, they conducted a modeling study to figure out what are the conditions required for vernalization. So I'm stepping back here and giving you a little bit more background information as to describe the results from our field trial. So what they found with this modeling study was that there's a normal vernalization temperature of 4.5 degrees Celsius. And then there's a window around that temperature uh, when plants are exposed to the temperature within that window from negative 2.9 to 11.9, they're receiving vernalization units. So we're going to think about this as vernalization units, kind of like growing degree units. When a plant is exposed to a temperature within a certain window, you can accumulate growing degree days. Um, but we're going to think this as vernalization units. What they found is about, a plant needs about 72 of these units um, for the primary induction to, to set, to make seed heads. They also found that photo period is important specifically for this secondary induction phase. Um, and there's some other research from the Picasso lab that supports this. So let me try to map this out here. There's primary induction and secondary induction and vernalization uh, for intermediate wheatgrass requires both. The primary induction is the plants need to be exposed to these vernalization units, 79 of them before elongation so that it can produce a seed head. Um, and then in the spring, photo period plays some role that we don't exactly fully understand yet. So we're gonna focus on those vernalization units as well as growing degree days. So growing degree days, when we plant our seed in let's say um, late summer, the, the seed plant germinates, emerges, and then from that point on, it is exposed to growing degree days. And the more growing degree days the plant gets, the faster it can grow and the bigger it can grow, more biomass it can put on before entering the overwintering phase. So we think that it's important that the plant needs to produce some biomass before it goes into the winter so that it can produce seed heads and um, more seed the next year. So that's this growing degree days from planting to winter dormancy. We measured that, quantified that for all of our different seeding dates. How many growing degree days were the plants exposed to before overwintering? Then we also use the climate data to count up the vernalization units for all of those seeding dates. Now, you can see that the, the shape is a little bit different because as it gets later into the fall, that's when we get more vernalization units. Earlier planting date, you may not get vernalization units right away because it just isn't cold enough. Um, but then as you get too cold, you also lose opportunity for vernalization when you, units. So there's kind of like this window in the fall to get those. And there's also a little window in the spring to get vernalization units. Um, but now photo period can interrupt this. So our question was, first of all, what planting dates result in the most grain yield? We just want to know that for from an agronomic perspective, when, when can we plant this to maximize grain yields? But then also, can we tease apart the influence of growing degree days in the fall versus vernalization units? Is one more important than the other or better at explaining grain yield than the other? So what we found is that fall growing degree days were indeed correlated with grain yield. So plants that received more growing degree days planted earlier produced more grain. So if you look at this figure, um, the points on the right were planted earlier. They had more growing degree days. Um, and then you can look at grain yield on the y-axis. See, so it's pretty clear here that the ones that were planted earlier had more grain yield. Except for at Kansas, that's the uh, diamonds and the dashed line. Um, there's actually the, the, the seeds that were sown in September produce the most grain. So there was actually an, you could plant too early in this site year. So we don't know if this is always gonna be the case, but in that situation, planting too earlier resulted in lower yields in Salina, Kansas. 
But all the other sites we just found earlier, the um, how about the effect of vernalization units on grain yield? Well, they were correlated, strongly correlated. So this is great. Well, now it shows, demonstrates in the field, these vernalization units are important. So that red line is uh, the line that the modeling study suggested is the, the breaking point. You need that many vernalization units. Stands, plants that don't get that many vernalization units are not expected to produce yield. So that would be on the left side of that line. Um, those on the right are getting plenty of vernalization units. They should be producing yield. And the green bar is the 95% confidence interval or some sort of variability that was reported in the paper around that uh, estimate. So that's actually a pretty big confidence interval, but it was a modeling study. But well, this is great because it, it lines up with what we observed in the field. Uh, stands or seeds that were planted uh, pretty late and didn't get 50 vernalization units, they didn't produce any seed, as we can see in that cluster on the left-hand side of the figure. Interestingly enough, we did find that there were some points in Rozo um, that did not get, I'm going to use my laser pointer here, these right here, didn't quite hit that 70 vernalization units, but still produce seed. Is it I guess why in Rozo, where it's really cold. Oh, shoot, I gave it away. Yeah. Uh, that would have been fun, though. Yeah. Snow. <laughs> so all of these unit, fertilization units and growing degree days, they're measured with air temperature. So the air temperature could be quite cold in Rozo, but there's a whole bunch of snow, and snow insulates the soil, so they could actually be getting more fertilization units. So that's uh, a, where we need to, I think, focus the next step of, re of our research on this topic is looking at some of these other element influence, uh, temperature. Um, a study was also conducted in Madison by the Picasso group, Carigi, Carigi and uh, found very similar results. So optimum seeding dates were early prior to September 1st, um, the results are here. And the number of growing degree days required for setting seed uh, also matched very similar to the, those that um, from the previous study of the multiple sites. So this is really great. One other thing, another study that was conducted, is this the same? Yeah, um, this is a greenhouse study that showed percent of plants that headed after a certain number of weeks being incubated at, I'm going to jump to it five degrees Celsius with 10 hours of light. So I calculated vernalization units the same way we did it in the paper. And these right here, right here's the 50 vernalization units mark. So again, when we get above that 50 vernalization units, we're seeing seed yield even in uh, greenhouse studies. So we're starting to see some consistencies here. So summary of this work, so seeds at a depth half inch and an inch, three quarters is best, but uh, for optimum emergence rates, sow seeds before September 1st. We've been saying this, we have a lot of good evidence now to suggest it in the upper Midwest, get in the field early if possible for maximum grain yields. Uh, snow could be insulating soil and affecting vernalization and accumulation of fall growing degree days. <laughs> um, as well as photo period exposure in the spring. So snow, yes, it's important for insulating the ground, but it also could be affecting um, how much light gets to the plants in the spring, which we know has something to do with fertilization. More research is needed there. Okay, we'll move on to fertility. There's been a lot of fertility work over the years um, in probably 2018, I probably gave a seminar here or a presentation here about nitrogen fertilizer rate study. Take home message, 80, 60 to 80 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare, for maximized grain yields. We use the TLI C4 germplasm for this study, which was multiple years and multiple sites. Lodging was an issue. So the plants did lodge at high nitrogen rates, those over 120. 
So we, we repeated that study again, um, new locations. We narrowed down the fertilizer rate interval, uh, focused on a bunch of rates between zero and 80, um, found out again that yields maximize right around that 80 kilograms per hectare. Lodging also occurred. We, we're still using C4 germplasm. Um, now I'm gonna show you some results from a little bit newer study. Uh, and we use TLI C5 in Minnesota Clearwater. So Minnesota Clearwater is shorter, less prone to lodging. So we are expecting that maybe the plants can take up a little bit more nitrogen, increase green yields without the lodging. So we might be seeing higher fertilization rate recommendations. But now we're also altering the timing of application. Everything we've done so far has been putting fertilizer on at green up. But what, what happens if we split that up? What if we just put all of our nitrogen in the fall? Um, there's various ways to do split application, fall and green up, green up in summer. So we started doing experiments with all of these. So here are some quick results. Um, stand age one, and this is multiple projects actually. Uh, there's a couple of different site years going on here, um, but this is just a summary of some, a couple of different trials. What we're seeing is that uh, that optimum nitrogen rate is still in that range of 80 to 100 uh, kilograms of nitrogen per hectare in the first year. And we're seeing very, very good grain yields first year. Uh, it is again around 80 in year two, at stand age two. We're still seeing this general decline of grain yield with stand age. Um, but this is averaged over timings. So now we're gonna dive into the timings a little bit. Um, and this is just first year data. So if you dump it all in the spring, you see the same thing. Maximize grain yield around 80 kilograms per hectare. Then we started our first rounds of splits. So these blue checked boxes are when the fertilizer was applied in half at green up and half at elongation. So a little bit later in the summer. Not much of a difference. And then we did our fall split. So first we did fall all, dumped all the nitrogen on the fall. And we saw a higher yield response in general. So greater yields with a fall nitrogen application. Um, and then we did fall splits. So this is some pretty interesting results. It, it appears that perhaps that shot of nitrogen in the fall is definitely benefiting grain yield. I shouldn't say definitely, it appears that it's benefiting grain yields. So here we looked at, uh, this is, that was just year one data. So now this is data from year age one, two, and three, and it's averaged over rates, but just looking at the effect of the timing. And in the first year, grain yields were maximized when all of it was applied to the spring, but that shifted dramatically in stand age two and stand age three which would make sense because if it's the first stand age, you give nitrogen to little baby kerns of plants right after seeding, they probably don't have a lot of ability to use it. So, but what we're seeing here is that the split application is definitely beneficial in stand age two and stand age three. But we're still getting a yield decline with stand age. So it's not getting rid of that problem. Um, next steps, there's a fertility trial in the CAP project. This, is, this has new uh, rates, five rates, zero to 160 pounds per acre. We're varying the timing um, with and without phosphorus and potassium. And we have treatments with both manure and urea. Uh, I'm not gonna walk through all of these treatments, but we're gonna be doing this at six sites in five different states. Uh, there's also a project that started a long time ago that we hope to pick up again at this meeting is to do a meta-analysis on all of these nitrogen rate trials. And I'm just presenting to you a few, but I think there are, are other data sets um, from other experiments. Actually, there definitely is. So the Steve Coleman study that uh, was conducted in multiple states um, over three or four years a while back, that has... Um, some nitrogen rate data, and there are a few other studies. So Andrea and Roberta are going to take the lead and do a meta-analysis 
um, with this data. And then what that'll be able to do is tell us, you know, on average, all these different, all these different site years, um, how does nitrogen affect intermediate wheatgrass grain yields? Uh, weed management, we'll shift gears here. Um, yeah, so what I'm first gonna show you is a little bit of data and just give you an update on um, getting herbicides labeled for use on intermediate wheatgrass for grain production. So this is um, an effort that was conducted by IR4, uh, an institution that helps um, get these products approved for specialty crops. And we did a trial, herbicide rate and timing trial across four different sites here, as you can see on the map. And there's a lot of details here, but we applied herbicides in the fall and in the spring. And then in the fall, we did this on established stands of Kernza, as well as freshly seeded stands to see if that's kind of stand age had made the plants more vulnerable to injury from the herbicides. We, the green arrows here indicate when we scored for injury and weed control, overwintered, um, then we had another round of treatments um, that received a spring application, did injury ratings two times before grain harvest, harvested grain. These are our treatments. Generally 2,4-D, clopyrrolid, MCPA, and a mix of clopyrrolid and MCPA. Here are the trade names um, of products you may have heard of. Um, we did this actually for two years um, at some sites, not all sites. And Erica who, from Wisconsin is here and she's gonna be taking the lead on writing this up and knows all the details. But just real quick summary, there is pretty much no effect of herbicide type, rate, or timing on intermediate wheatgrass injury. Intermediate wheatgrass really was not injured by these products at, at all. Um, there's no effect um, either on grain yield. So as a result, Weed R64 has been um, labeled for use on intermediate wheatgrass for grain production. So that is the first herbicide that's available for currents of production. Other studies that have been done on weed control and weed dynamics. Um, some work done in Wisconsin by Joe Zimbrick, um, who's gone now, but he's a master student in Valentin's lab. Found that weed biomass decreased over the life of a Kernza stand across those three years. 88% reduction in weed biomass. So the first year can be really challenging. Anecdotally, we've seen that. It's been documented in a few of these papers. Um, but as the Kernza intermediate wheatgrass ages, gets better at holding its own against the weed competition. Also important, the weed community shifted from annuals to perennials. Um, and this could vary depending on the seed bank at site to site. Um, but a group at Cornell and um, Eugene Law with Matt Ryan's lab found the same thing. Um, that the weed community shifted from annuals to perennials really quick after the, even the second year. Um, they found that intercropping intermediate wheatgrass with red clover um, reduced weed biomass even further um, compared to an, an, a monoculture. And there was no negative effects of the intercrop on currents of grain yields. So adding the legume didn't do anything to current yield, but it did reduce weed pressure. Uh, next steps, changes in weed species composition. What are these perennials that are emerging these stand time? Um, how are those changing through time? We've seen some interesting things in the field um, with Canada thistle that actually looks like intermediate wheatgrass might reduce Canada thistle populations in a field. So it would be really great to document that. Um, what are the effects of intermediate wheat or weeds on wheatgrass yields. So this is a photo of some pennycrest in a intermediate wheatgrass stand. Pennycrest flushes that seed pretty early in Minnesota relative to the growth and development of the intermediate wheatgrass. And, you know, there's not, it doesn't seem like there's much negative effect of pennycrest and, and shepherd's purse on grain yields. So it would be nice to, to document that as well. 
There's also a lot of questions about companion cropping to control weeds in that first year when they're most, wheatgrass is most vulnerable. Companion cropping either with fall plantings or with spring plantings. Um, I think more research could be done on that. Last topic for this talk is um, harvest challenges. To swath or not to swath? That is the question. So the advantages of swathing, well, flexible harvest timing, any time after physiological maturity, um, when the grain, when the seeds are full, grain may not require mechanical drying. Um, if it all dries uniformly in the field and you don't have to, and you don't get any rain on the windrow, um, it seems to generally result in cleaner seed, less weed seed. Maybe there's less processing involved then. Disadvantages, you got to time it right, have that window of time with no rain so that dries out in the field. Um, if it does get rained on, or maybe if it doesn't, that grain's vulnerable to microbial contamination. Um, it's laying there in the field, in the elements. Um, what kind of effects does that have on like dawn levels and mycotoxin levels? Uh, on the other hand, we can direct combine, just go out into the field and harvest the grain right from the standing plants. Advantage, fewer passes. It's just one pass through the field, less equipment's involved. Uh, disadvantages, it'll, if you want to do it at the same time as, uh, as you would swath, you're going to have wetter grain and you're going to grow the ability to dry that. A grower could also just wait for the grain to dry down on the seed heads so that it's at a safe moisture content for storage after direct combining. But waiting means shattering, so potential yield losses there. So what are we to do? Well, uh, Garrett helped this experiment here um, that was conducted at multiple sites where we measured the change in seed size and moisture through time the spikes, uh, collecting data to inform when to harvest. So the study was conducted over a number of different years at these locations. One of the best things that came out of this paper, I think is this beautiful diagram that Garrett constructed. Uh, just it explains all the parts of an intermediate wheatgrass spike. I love it. Um, we got spikelets, I'll be referring to those. That's the, the clusters of the seeds. Then uh, there's a number of florets within each spike split, and a floret is the possible site of a seed. Um, then we have our caryopsis and the lemon palea or the hulls. It's all explained here. So theoretically, um, on the well, let's on the x-axis, I'm going to show you some figures. It's going to be growing degree days since or post anthesis. So at the time of flowering, we started the clock and counted growing degree days and added those up. Um, until we sampled the plants. Um, and on the y-axis here, this is a theoretical conceptual graph. That's the percent moisture in the seed. So right away when it's, after it's fertilized, it's gonna be very moist, high moisture content. But then as that plant, the physiological maturity approaches that, uh, it dries out. So this is, generally the pattern that we would expect. It's wet for a long period of time as it fills. And then there's a certain point when it starts drying down. And then at some point it's gonna reach like a, a, a plateau and it's not gonna get any drier. So, you know, when does it start drying down? What is the level of moisture content when it reaches that plateau? We have all kinds of questions about this. Previous research on perennial grasses has shown that there are these really distinct breakpoints. It's not like really a smooth flow. There's a point in time when there's a shift, a phase change. So we tested this model to see if it um, occurred in the intermediate wheatgrass. So I'm gonna show you lots of graphs here, but each point, so like this, let's see, this point right here is the moisture content of seeds that were harvested rather early, only 200 days, if that, since anthesis. So these are really, really early. You would have never harvest grain at this point. Um, but what we did is every five days went out and collected seed heads, picked them apart, um, weighed the seeds, dried them, weighed them again to get moisture content. And we did this at all these sites. 
And we also split the seeds into three different fractions, um, the top, middle, and bottom. And that's because the seed heads mature from the top down. And we wanted to know um, how different were the rates of maturity in these different parts of the spike. So when a grower goes out in the field and they see that all the seeds on the top are, they're dried down, brown, ready to harvest, but those in the bottom are still green and full of moisture. What is one to do? Do you wait until the seeds in the bottom are dried, uh, ready to harvest, knowing that the ones in the top are going to shatter? You know, is it worth it to wait for those? That's some of the questions that we were trying to ask this study. So what this figure shows is that we definitely had these phase changes, um, really distinct breaking points in when the seeds started to dry down. So we asked the question, well, yeah, how many growing degree days accumulated before that started to happen? And I'll get to the numbers in just a bit. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, as time goes on, as growing degree days accumulate after flowering, the seeds are getting bigger. And we want to know when they reach their maximum size. So you don't want to go out and harvest before they're at their maximum size. So that's, we're looking for this 95% maximum weight. And we know that seeds are shattering. We know that they're getting bigger. And as they mature, they start to shatter. And that means that grain yield on a, on a spike is going to be follow some sort of trend like this. It's, it's, it's peak, and then it's going to decrease because of shattering. So there's a lot of information in this next figure. Um, what this shows is the dotted line is when that phase change occurred and seeds started to dry down. The black bar describes the duration of that dry down period. The solid line is the peak uh, yield for, or no, this, that's when the uh, seed size was maximized. And this point right here is peak spike yield. So when you're gonna get the most grain per spike. And then all the shaded area is when shattering was occurring. So we can see here just from this one figure, shattering occurred after the phase change, the dry down period began. Um, and sometime in between that dry down period, it also started and occurred before the seeds reached their maximum size, which is this black line. So we can deduce kind of a lot of information from these figures. And we have a lot of figures to show. So we have these for different um, states, Minnesota, New York, Wisconsin, and then for the different positions along the spike. So just really a lot to, to break apart there. Um, a lot of that interpretation is packaged um, this table. So what we have here is the number of growing degree days when uh, up until the rapid dry down phase began. So if one wanted to predict when the seeds are gonna start drying, they could look to these numbers and do some bad calculations. So if you know when your field flowered, you could predict in a way when that rapid dry down phase is gonna begin. It also has estimates of the moisture content when that rapid dry down phase began. So in the 40s to 50% moisture content. And then the moisture content at the end of the rapid dry down phase. So if one were to go out and just harvest the grain right off the plants, um, at the end of the rapid dry down phase, the moisture content would be at this percentage. Um, the rates of uh, moisture loss during that dry down phase, that's a nice number to have. Um, and then here's all the seed size metrics. So weight per 100 seeds, um, at that maximum seed size. Lots of information. I won't go through all the numbers. What are the take home messages? Rapid moisture loss begins between 400 and 600 growing degree days after flowering. Maximum seed weight occurs um, a little bit later, between 650 and 1,000 growing degree days. So if you get seeds, you're going to have to wait until after 650 growing degree days. However, Maximum grain yields because of uh, the shattering, the optimum harvest window is actually a little bit earlier than that, between 550 and 750 growing degree days post-anthesis. 
So it may not be wise to wait till your seeds are as large as possible for maximizing grain yields. There's definitely trade-offs here. Uh, what measuring seed shatter rates through time? I think there's a lot of work that could be done around that. Um, determining the contribution of the sh shattered seed to wheatgrass recruitment. Um, this, there's some evidence that suggests that uh, as the stands fill in, that's what's driving yield decline. Well, are the shattered seeds contributing to that fill in? Um, if so, is, you know, is this gonna be a problem? So this is just a photo of the after a combine went past. There's a lot of what looks like potential seeds here. There's definitely a lot of hulls. Whether those hulls have seeds in them, it's hard to tell, but you know, this is what could be happening. Um, and then the effects of those harvesting techniques, swathing versus direct combining on grain quality. So grain quality, um, George would love to talk to you about this, like the functional characteristics of the grain, are those changing depending on the timing of harvest? The vulnerability to mycotoxins and dawn levels, those are all changing. Um, this, if you take one thing away from this presentation, just walk away with this slide, it just has like a one point bullet point of all the things we found in these uh, major categories recently. So again, I just wanna thank all the contributors in the Sustainable Cropping Systems Lab, um, all the students, um, undergraduate students, technicians, a uh, whole suite of people at the University of Minnesota, the perennial crop pioneers who let us do crazy experiments on farm. So thank you. And then funders and a bunch of other folks. So maybe barely enough time for a question. Thanks, Jake. Um, there was a question online that was, might you change the nitrogen you'd recommend if you include the forage in your calculation? If we harvest the now, forage. If you, if you care about forage, does that change it versus grain? All of our studies have really just focused on um, identifying nitrogen rates to maximize grain yields. So perhaps it would be interesting to look at the change in the harvest index from different nitrogen rates and timing there. 